Right. Hello and good evening, everybody. Um, Hello. Hi. I uh, do apologize for any difficulties we've had this evening. It's just due to the popularity of the guest speaker that we're about to introduce this evening. So um, I can say if we're all uh, good to go, I'm going to introduce you this evening to uh, Dr. Paul Clayton. <laughs> and this evening we are going to be talking about the science behind the wonderful Zinzino products that we have. Um, before I go any further, I'm going to actually tell you something about this, uh, this gentleman who's on, on the call this evening. Um, Paul uh, graduated with the very highest of distinction from um, Edinburgh University uh, in uh, medical pharmacology before uh, he obtained his uh, PhD. He's a former uh, scientific advisor to the UK Government Committee on the Safety of Medicines, and he was also chair of the Forum of Food and Health of the Royal Society of Medicine in the UK. Um, he's currently a fellow of the Institute of the Food, Brain and Behaviour uh, in, in Oxford. And um, Paul works internationally, um, continually uh, traveling the globe, working with leading doctors and clinical scientists in centers of excellence, designing and <clears throat> supervising preclinical and clinical trials and pharmaco-nutrition uh, interventions. He frequently presents across the world at conferences uh, on nutrition and health, and he sits on the advisory board of uh, companies in the healthcare sector, including Zinzino, I'm glad to say, and teaches students at universities and um, uh, across, uh, across Europe. Amongst that, Paul, I don't know how you find time, but um, he's also written and penned various books, including Health Defence, After Atkins, Natural Defences, and Out of the Fire. <laughs> uh, what do you do with the other 22 hours in your day, Paul? Um, he's a key He's a keen student of medical history. I know that from working with him for the last six months. And tonight, Paul is going to shine the light on how public health has arrived at where it is today, which is in a very poor state across the globe, and discuss what we can do to change this by looking, as I said, at the science behind Zinzino products. So after such a long uh, welcome, Paul, welcome to the call. Uh Thank you. Have you left any time at all for me to talk? <laughs> there's plenty of time. Um, this evening we've got a real mixed audience uh, because there's a varying degree of knowledge and expertise. So bear that in mind as we are going through the call, if you would, this mm -hmm. evening. Um, okay. And I've obviously explained to you, uh, explained about you. Could you give us some background on yourself and tell us how your relationship with Zinzino started, if you would, please? Uh, well, I'm a perennial student. Um, I was at Edinburgh University uh, by alma mater for a long, long time. I collected, I think, three degrees before I left. And I didn't really want to leave. I just wanted to go on studying. <laughs> but duty called. I had to go and earn a living somehow. And so then I um, <clears throat> did a series of different things. I worked for the UK government, which was interesting and gave me an insight into how the regulatory system works and uh, the way in which government, uh, by and large, doesn't work. And then I started moving over slowly and by imperceptible stages into industry. And I worked for Boots the Chemist. I was sort of acting as a uh, informal head of their um, vetting process. You know, they get approached by different companies selling supplements uh, probably 10 or 20 times a week. And most of them are junk. Every now and then, something semi-decent comes through, and my job was to be the gatekeeper and uh, weed all the rubbish out and allow a very select, a very small number of people through into the inner sanctum where they could uh, present their science, and then Boots would make a decision as to whether or not it was commercial. Um, I've worked for companies in the pharmaceutical sector, in the food industry, I mean, the giants, all of these, you know, the biggest brands that you've heard of, and in the supplement industry, and I've got to the point where I'm very disenchanted with all of them. We have an out of control food industry, which is selling food that is really can only be described as being toxic, responsible for a huge amount of um, illness. We have a pharmaceutical industry that says thank you to the food industry for creating so much disease, which we will then treat these are our, our cash cows and we'll give them drugs which really don't do much more than treat their symptoms and mean that they're our clients for life. 
And the supplement industry tries its best to step into that gap in between the two, but by and large, it fails miserably. Most of the supplements um, available in the market today are a complete waste of time and money. Uh, to give you two examples, the single most lucrative type of supplement is the fish oil supplement, worth billions of dollars every year, has absolutely no effect whatsoever. <clears throat> it's been put through a large number of uh, prospective large randomized clinical trials and fish oil supplements don't do anything for anybody. Vitamin and minerals, you know, they are A to Z products, have no effect either. They've been tested and found wanting. And you won't do yourself much good by taking a daily effervescent vitamin C tablet either. Now it's a shame because this industry potentially has a good deal to offer. But the problem is most of it is extremely badly designed, run by people who clearly don't know what they're doing. And the customers are equally bewildered because it's hard to be an expert in all of these nutritional issues. And most individuals, most customers, don't really know what they're buying. So uh, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, I speak out regularly against these types of problems. I've got lots of enemies in the food industry, the pharmaceutical industry and the supplement industry. Uh, and um, decided that I would try and create an area somewhere in the middle, which had some of the attributes of all of those systems, produce formulations which were derived from foods but where the science basis was so strong that we could demonstrate effect, that we could test effect. Uh, and they are by and large, you can consider them to be antidotes to the current modern, the modern lifestyle, the modern diet. They are so powerful that they are, I think more powerful than many pharmaceutical products. So they're not drugs, they're not foods, they're not really traditional supplements either. They fit somewhere in the middle in a, in a space that we call pharmaconutrition. And the reason why I work with Zenzino is because I had been advising a small company called Oil for Life, which where uh, the balance oil concept was developed. And that was something I'd been uh, interested in and had been working on for a decade. And then when Zenzino uh, came and swallowed up Oil for Life, they, you know, Zenzino came along like a whale and swallowed up Oil for Life. And I was just part of the office furniture. I got picked up along with all the rest of it. And very shortly after that, I had a meeting with Doug and Orian, the people who run the company, and um, <clears throat> they said, well, if you want to stay with us, what would you like to do? And I said, I think that given the way that this new science is developing, we could carve out this niche called pharmacoenutrition. We could become a life science company. And I think they felt that was pretty unusual and you know, potentially an exciting area. And they said, okay, well, why don't we do that? And I said, okay, what's the brief? And I've told this story before because it was so unusual. Their response was, just do the best you can. And I've never had a brief like that before mm -hmm. <laughs> from any client. Yeah. And it was, uh, I couldn't resist it. Um, I started uh, developing uh, pharmacoenutritional formulations for them. And that culminated in Extend, in Xenobiotic, in the Skin Serum, in Viva, and a couple of other things we're working on. And the rest is history. Okay. These, these formulations are so are really extremely effective. I, they, they're not foods, they're not supplements, they're not drugs. They have the attributes of all of these things, they're, but they're completely safe. And they're so effective that we now have hundreds, if not thousands of doctors by now flocking to join us in countries all over the world because they've seen how effective these products are in their patients, in their family members, and very often in, in themselves because doctors are as unhealthy as everybody else they get the same problems, healthcare, health issues as everybody else. They need help. And they know that the drugs they have only treat the symptoms, nothing more. Uh, they're very well aware of just how toxic, how danger, uh, they're dangerous the pharmaceuticals that they use are. And so many of them are very open to a new approach, of an approach which is more profound, which is safer, which is more curative. Um, okay. And that's where we are now. Okay, thank you, Paul. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's fantastic. In terms of, you, you, you apparently coined the phrase pharmaconutrition, did you not, some 30 years ago, am I right in saying? A uh, long time ago now. That was, a, <laughs> that was a different world. I remember being at a meeting of the Committee on Safety of Medicines at, in some big committee room in London, and uh, there were 20 or 30 professors there, all, you know, the grey beards, uh, of which I've become one of them myself now. <laughs> 
and they were talking about pharmaceutical toxicological issues. And I said, well, look, there is a, an alternative, I think. Why don't we work with natural pharmacology? Because clearly it's safer. These are all compounds derived from fruits and based on the emerging science, it looks as if we can do a lot more with them. And they said, well, what do you, what do you call it? And I said, pharmaconutrition. Right. And the response was uniformly hostile. They said, that doesn't exist. That's not a word. What do you even mean by it? And then I sort of explained, well, I think what we can do is we can use the pharmacological, the, the, the known pharmacological effects of foods and food extracts, and we can cross-reference them against the multiple metabolic errors caused by the modern lifestyle and use that to stop the progression of disease, to reverse it and to allow healing. Now, these are enormous claims to make. And I think until relatively recently, most doctors would not have taken this very seriously, but we've now seen so many cases where people with very serious, very serious lifestyle diseases have gotten involved in these programs and in a fairly short period of time, their symptoms have become less, their diseases have stabilized, they have begun to heal. Many of them have gone on to become drug-free. And it's when doctors see patients like that, that they really start to get interested. Because Absolutely. many doctors, I think I mean, they, they practice from their hearts, they want to help people. At the moment, if they're traditionally trained, all they have access to are the rather toxic pharmaceutical products that they've learned, they, 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 they've learned about, that they're taught about at medical school. The world of natural pharmacology is rather foreign to them. But once they understand that this is a science, that it is a testable science, that it is a, a, a consistent science, and once they see the benefits in their patients, in their family members, and in themselves, the light goes on and they, they want to join us. One of the reasons for the success we've had is that I don't talk about nutrition. Uh, I talk about the pharmacology of food and doctors may not know much about nutrition, but they understand pharmacology because they, they're taught that at school. I studied it for several years when I was at medical school. So that's a language they're comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, and it's something that increasingly they want to be able to know, they want to be able to understand it, they want to be able to implement it in their patients. Fine. So rather than talking about just nutrition, which is a small element necessarily of their, of their background and training, then they obviously understand the principle of pharmacology. That's the common denominator here, yeah? Yes, yes. Okay. And I don't, I don't discriminate between synthetic pharmacology, pharmaceutical pharmacology, and natural pharmacology. It's all pharmacology. Fine. Paul, um, I want to talk about the general population in a moment, but I do know just uh, from uh, having heard you speak before that on your personal journey uh, to, to the point right now, you, you actually um, cured yourself, if you like, or uh, improved symptoms. Am, am I right possibly in saying you cured yourself from a, a hypothyroidism situation that you found yourself in years ago? Uh, yes, this is over a decade ago now, and I was going through an extraordinarily stressful period in my life, and the, uh, this triggered an autoimmune disease, Graves' disease. I wasn't your classical patient. Uh, I was, however, a classical medic, because I wasn't paying attention to my own symptoms, and I didn't realize how serious things had become until, uh, I mean, I'd lost a lot of weight, I was burning up, I mean, I, mean, I had all the classic symptoms. And, um, and then one morning I woke with a heartbeat of 130 and I'd gone into atrial fibrillation. Now, luckily, even although my um, upper heart had gone haywire, the lower heart was very strong because I've always been very athletic. So I got out of bed. I realized by then something was seriously wrong, finally. And I walked off to the hospital, which was a mile and a half away. And I got there and they put the EC, they did an ECG and uh, so they couldn't believe that I'd walked there in the first place because a man of my age with that kind of heart arrhythmia would normally be flat out. But I didn't, I didn't honestly feel too bad at that point. And they just said, okay, your temperature, your basic metabolic rate, your arrhythmia, yeah, classic graves. They took the bloods. I had antithyroid antibody. My thyroxine levels were through the roof. I was a classic case. And I was given, um, you know, the usual medical spiel, <clears throat> which is, well, what we'll do is we'll um, surgically remove the thyroid and then you'll be on thyroid replacement hormone therapy for the rest of your life. I wasn't crazy about that. And I thought, well, maybe I can put out the fire, stop this autoimmune condition. Now there's a whole debate 
going on in medical circles about what autoimmune disease actually is. And there's probably more than one different basic type. But this one was, I think, a genuine autoimmune disease where you get um, the thyroid itself, I think, had been physically damaged by the stress. Components had been exposed to the immune system, which would not normally be exposed. The immune system had found a target and was starting to attack it. When this happens, the immune system is actually damaging the target, whether it's the thyroid, as in my case, or it could be the beta cells in the islands of Langerhans in your pancreas in the, type, in the case of type 1 diabetes. It could be components in your joint capsules in rheumatoid arthritis. There's, there's 100 different autoimmune diseases, all very interesting, unless you actually have one. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I can put out the fire. Maybe I can stop the immune system from attacking its target. And what I knew is that when the immune system starts to destroy its target, it does so by causing a local chronic inflammation. That's what destroys the target. And I thought, well, if I can put out the inflammation for long enough, if I can put out that fire in a way that is effective but not toxic, so I wasn't going to use steroids or anything like that or methotrexate or any of the pharmaceutical products, they're too damn toxic. Mm -hmm. But if I could use omega-3s and lipophile polyphenols, which we now, which was later put into balance oil, I thought I can stop the inflammation so thoroughly that the immune system will still be sniffing around, but it won't be able to do anything. And maybe it will learn that that's not really a target. It was just a guess, an aspiration. So I used this approach, stopped the inflammation, and immediately started to feel better. And kept my omega-6-3 index, which is what happens, which is what changes when you start using these omega-3s and polyphenols, kept it really low at about between one and a half and two, so that no inflammation could take place, no further tissue could be destroyed. And I kept the ratio very low for, I think it was four months or so. And at that point I thought, well, let's see what happens if I stop taking this mixture because that was before balance oil. And I, I, there, you, there was nothing, I, could, I had to make it up myself. I was drinking fish oil by the pint, um, <laughs> olive oil by the glass, and it was disgusting. I really didn't want to keep on doing it. And I thought, if I ease up on the brakes now, what's going to happen? So I rather gingerly started tapering off. And to my surprise and to my relief, what I found was I didn't revert. I didn't, the, the, the hyperthyroid condition didn't come back. My immune system had been redirected. It had forgotten its target. Um, and I now don't really have to worry that much about, you know, keeping these very high intakes of omega-3s and polyphenols. It doesn't really matter because I no longer have an autoimmune disease. The doctors who diagnosed me at the hospital where I was at the time, that was in Epsom, just outside London, you know, I'm, I'm on their records as a confirmed Graves patient. But I went back there, uh, you know, five or six years ago and, um, I said, look, uh, you remember me, don't you? And they said, yeah, we've got you on record. Why don't you just um, take my bloods and see what's going on? And they could see that I didn't have a thyroid problem. I mean, at a gross level, I didn't have any of the symptoms. And I said, well, you don't look like an untreated gross patient. Um, first of all, you're alive. And secondly, <laughs> you don't have any of the other related problems. But they took the bloods and they said, well, you're, you still have very slightly elevated levels of anti-thyroid antibodies, but your TSH and your thyroid hormone levels are normal. What have you done? <laughs> so I said, look, I did this and this and this, and they sort of scratched their heads because they hadn't heard of anything like that before. I said, well, whatever you, you've done, um, either it was effective or this was a million to one thing that never happens. Somehow it's a mir medical miracle that happened and keep on doing what you're doing. Um, I subsequently found, I made contact with a group of doctors in the United States in and around Boston who'd been treating type one diabetes in exactly the same way and had had the same results. Now, if you're going to treat an autoimmune condition with this approach, it is only going to be helpful if you get in there very early. If the Graves disease or you know the type one diabetes had progressed to the point where the target tissue had been completely destroyed at that point, stopping inflammation is going to have no effect at all. Right. But if you can stop the immune attack at a point when, you know, there may be symptoms, but at least there's enough viable tissue left to keep you going, then we can begin to start thinking in terms of cure. Now, yeah. this is anathema to a classically trained doctor who's been taught 
once the immune system has found its target, it never lets up. You're going to be there for the duration. It's going to go to the end point, and this is how we treat it. And that was just the first of several, I mean, first of many, many instances where I began to experience the fact that real medicine and textbook medicine are actually quite far apart in some areas. Autoimmune right. disease is one, degenerative disease is another. Paul, it's quite incredible that you are at the forefront of leading a, um, for want of a better expression, a revolution in terms of the pharmaconutrition uh, treatment uh, using uh, balanced oil, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But for you to actually have had the personal experience, albeit just taking pure fish oil and olive oil, which does sound quite disgusting, and to get to the point of curing Graves' disease is, is quite incredible. Um, Paul, I have to say uh, that I read your book, which was highly enlightening, the, the uh, Let Your Food Be Your Pharmacoconutrition, and I learned a lot from that. Um, could we focus at this point on what has happened? So looking at the changes in both the UK and global health from what you refer to in your book as the halcyon days of the Victorian period to, to now. So the degeneration of society, the change, or rather the health of society, can you just explain to us uh, in your own words, obviously, how, how that's happened? Well, if there's any historians in the audience, they will know that there are several Victorian ages. There's the early, mid, and late Victorian age, and they're all rather different. The early mid-Victorian age, up to uh, probably about 1850, is characterized by intermittent food shortages and famines, and that's not a particularly healthy time. The late Victorian period, which is when you start getting into the early 20th century, isn't that great either, because the British Empire, which has grown up tremendously in the second half of the 19th century, is now so extensive and so powerful. It's bringing lots of tobacco and sugar and other and, and high octane alcohol back from the colonies, and it's pouring that into the national diet and national health goes into a steep decline. So I'm talking about a half century, 1850 to 1900. And during that island in time, Britain had a fantastically good diet and phenomenally good health as a result. In fact, so good that it's almost certainly the most important factor that contributed to the growth of the British Empire. I mean, remember, we were a small, damp little island off the west coast of Europe, and somehow we managed to color a third of the atlas pink. And if you remember your geography textbooks from school days, the British Empire used to be colored traditionally in pink for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the reasons was that we had an army, a navy, and a workforce that was better nourished, stronger, healthier, more resilient, had more stamina, and smarter than any other nation in the world. That was how we carved out our empire. It is facilitated also by the two factors that made this fantastic nutrition possible, which is the agricultural revolution, which is really sort of 1840, 1850, 1855, and, it, and um, increases agricultural productivity almost tenfold. And then the development of the, the, the industrial revolution, the development of the railway system, which rapidly spreads out across the, the country, so that all this increased agricultural productivity can be brought into the cities where people are working. Now they're working manually, it's a blue collar society. You know, forget Downton Abbey. I mean, most people are blue collar workers working with their backs and their hands. And they're burning a lot of calories. If you look at the, uh, the lifestyle of the navvies, the navigators, and they're at the bottom of the socioeconomic pecking order, they are actually burning up to 7,000 calories a day. And yet look at the photographs of them, they're thin because they're burning those calories. It's all being consumed in physical energy. So this is a culture that is very physically active, eating a lot of food, far more than we do now. And none of it is ultra processed. It's all simple, basic produce with a low calorie density and a high nutrient density, which is the opposite to us because we're eating these industrial processed foods, which have a high calorie density and a low nutrient density. So we get fatter, but inside we're starving. And it's that combination that creates this huge problem of chronic inflammation and chronic degenerative disease, which has become so important today, but which barely existed in the mid-Victorian period. Okay, and when we're looking at the food sources, you talk about heritage vegetables, heritage fruits, and they are now almost depleted from our, our food chain, correct? In terms of the, the content of polyphenol within the food varieties is almost being farmed out, genetically modified foods and so on and so forth. 
So if we haven't got that in our diet and we haven't got the level of fish and omega-3 that we want to eating, because I, again, you've alluded to the fact that, that things like um, uh, oysters were, were available with in alehouses free, free. So when you look at this combination that, that, that's brought us to the, the, the point we're at now, which is almost to our knees with the level of chronic inflammatory diseases that are prevalent in, uh, in society today, then, then you are pointing the finger very firmly uh, at this change in our, in our, dietary, uh, in our dietary habits. And, uh, oh, it's, right? inc it's incontrovertible. There is such a wealth of evidence. And the, the large, the multinational food companies, and there's only a handful of them which dominate the global food space, are now killing more people than the tobacco industry. Yeah, it's a shocking statistic, an absolutely shocking statistic. But like you say, it's, it's, uh, it's clearly very obvious. Paul, um, I know the moment is upon us where COVID-19 has uh, dominated the news and clearly it's a very, very sad situation for those people that are losing their loved ones around the world. Um, can we just touch on that? Because it, it wouldn't be right not to do so this evening because we are looking at uh, obviously public health. Could you just uh, give, give us your views on, on the situation regarding COVID-19 currently? Am I allowed to be a bit controversial? Um, within reason. <laughs> why, why not, Paul? It is you after all. Well, if you look at uh, mortality rates, in most countries, the mortality rates from COVID-19 are substantially less than they are from your typical average annual flu. Let's just keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. There's only one country where they're higher, and that's Sweden, where they haven't had these lockdowns. A little bit higher, about 80% higher than in an average year, but still within the historical range. Um, and when you get the COVID virus, it kills you in the same way that flu does. If you're unlucky, you go through pneumonia, you go through a cytokine storm. It's, it, you know, COVID-19 is really just like a flu virus. Flu kills 500,000 people in an average year, a million in a bad year, such as 1968, that was Hong Kong flu. In a spectacularly bad year, 1918, it kills up to 100 million. So these flu viruses and coronaviruses have always been washing around the globe. They always, they're always here. They like come back again and again. And uh, with this new virus, COVID-19, COVID doesn't seem to be really different from any of the rest of them. Um, but what it does have is fantastic PR. And it's been grabbed by politicians all over the world as an excuse to increase their power base and to decrease our freedoms. I think that they've been uh, extremely duplicitous about it. And I think that uh, older, uh, new fascists like Bill Gates and old ones like Soros, both of whom are heavily invested in the technologies of tracking and vaccination and who stand to make enormous sums of money if they can have these policies made mandatory and they own enough politicians to achieve that, I think that for them it is an enormous business opportunity. For the rest of us, it is a huge impoverishment because we will not see a V-shaped recovery. When we come out of this, we are all of us, except for the elites, going to emerge substantially less well off. Mm -hmm. In terms of, um, we're going to look at now, obviously, in terms of, to the, the science behind our products, but in terms of um, the, the immunity, I, I've heard you talk about the, the fact that obviously there's a, there's a recovery rate at a certain stage, and, and then obviously you then go into, into decline. Can you just expand on that just briefly for us before we move on? Yes, of course. The, the reason why people are alarmed about COVID-19 is because it's had a lot of publicity and because it's transmits so quickly that... And we're, unlike an ordinary flu, which develops relatively slowly, so the peak is relatively low, COVID-19 spreads quickly, the peak is high, so you get the surge into the hospitals and then the hospitals are overwhelmed. That's really been the crux of the problem. But then if we look at the time course of the disease, it actually, I think, opens up opportunities to reduce this surge, which means you don't have to go through this expensive buying it, ridiculous numbers of ventilators, which are extremely ineffective anyway. By the time you get to the point where you need ventilation, you're more than likely than not to die anyway. So the ventilators are not really a very useful answer to this problem at all. But let's go back to basics. Let's look at the time course of the infection. 
once it starts in an individual. There's an initial phase of viremia, which could be six, seven, nine days. And during that time, the virus is in your blood, in your tonsils, at the back of the throat, one or two other tissues as well. And you might have symptoms like a sore throat, slight fever, headaches, some muscle pains. You might not have any symptoms at all. 50% of people, according to the latest Icelandic data, have this virus and have no symptoms. This is not a bioweapon. It's not even a very effective pathogen. 50% of people have no symptoms. So out of the 50% who do, you go through that initial stage. And after that, about 85 or 90% will then turn left. They recover and get better all on their own. Maybe 10% will start getting worse and some of them will get to the point where they require hospital treatment. That time course is telling us that it is the innate immune system that is important in determining whether you recover and turn left or whether your immune system fails and you go downhill and need more intensive treatment. The innate immune system, the way it protects you against viral infections, does so not so much through immune cells, but through a range of immune chemicals. And they include hydrogen peroxide, hypochlorous acid, and they're produced by immune cells, and two other compounds, hypothiocyanite and hypoiodide. And they're produced by an immune enzyme called lactoperoxidase. Now, all of these compounds uh, are mild prooxidants. Um, the, last, the latter two, hypoiodide and hypothiocyanate, in particular, are really interesting because they're very good at damaging viruses and not damaging our host cells. Whereas if you have too much hydrogen peroxide or hypochlorous acid, you can do yourself some damage. <clears throat> Um, what these chemicals do, they don't actually kill the virus because the virus isn't really alive to start with. What they do do is they'll damage various structural components on its surface. And once you've done that, the virus is no longer able to attach to the next cell, enter it, and then go through the cycle of replication, cell death release, and then reinvasion. If you can create an environment in the body where the innate immune system is capable of producing all these four chemicals at optimal levels, your chances of recovering and being in that 85% who turn left and recover are much higher. Here's the problem. In order for your body to make these four chemicals, you need a lot of nutrients. You need iron, you need manganese, you need iodine, you need cyanogens, which is a relatively unfamiliar group of rather atypical of phytonutrients, which are essential because you need them for immune function. You need zinc. You need a couple of other micronutrients as well. And here's the problem. If you look at today's diet, levels of all of these compounds have gone into a steep decline. So your immune cells are not as functional as they were. Your enzymes aren't as functional as they were. Your innate immune system has been degraded in many ways. When I first started looking at uh, what they call disease X, and this is a theoretical virus that was put forward by the WHO several years ago, this was a pathogen that had high transmission, a bit like COVID-19, but also high virulence, a bit like H5N1. This was the nightmare scenario, the Andromeda strain that would spread rapidly, kill everybody, and it would be the end of the world as we know it. <clears throat> And I thought, well, if it's a virus and what are our viral defenses, how can we make sure that they're in the best shape? And that was the basis of Extend. It's called Extend because of disease X. You know, COVID-19 is not disease X, but Extend, I believe, will be just as effective in helping you to be in that group, the larger group that improves as opposed to the smaller group that becomes seriously ill. If we can include, improve that split from 85, 15 or 90, 10 to 95, five, you cut the numbers of patients requiring hospital submission in half. That would be the best thing we could do to help the poor old overburdened healthcare service. And it would be safe and easy to do because all of these nutrients, you know, zinc and selenium and beta glucans and cyanogens and manganese, they're all incredibly safe. They're very suitable for public health optimization programs. You can put them into foods. You can put them into breakfast cereals, chocolate biscuits. You could probably put them into beer. And if you did that, selective fortification of the food supply, improving herd immunity, 
I believe that we could dramatically cut down the numbers of people who get this SARS-19 and then become seriously ill and then have to be taken up into tertiary and quaternary healthcare. Okay, wouldn't that be a wonderful situation <clears throat> if, because we're gonna be approaching diseases of this nature for time going forward. And if we can improve that immunity, like you say, and stop people turning right and make sure they go left and, and recover, then that can only be a good thing. And clearly we can just look at extend and then a little bit more detail in just a moment, if we may. Paul, moving on, and that's so interesting, I'm sure for, for both, certainly for me, and I'm sure for all the audience listening. Um, so turning to the science behind the products, um, extend forms part of what we call our health protocol. And that's made up of the three products of extend, obviously Xenobiotic and the number one major product that we have we currently have in our portfolio, which is the Zinzino Balance Oil. Can we talk about the Zinzino Balance Oil and in the combination with the test? So just talk to us about that, Paul, if you would, and tell us the benefits, if you would, of taking the oil and why we should all be in balance. There's, when you start to develop chronic inflammation, and we know that chronic inflammation is at the core, it's the driver of all chronic degenerative disease. Um, there are two, there are several stages, but two of the important stages involve omega sixes and omega threes, the ratio between the two. And then further down that chain, there's a step where the polyphenols play a role. Um, because of today's modern, you know, to the industrial ultra processed diet, people have a ratio of sixes to threes, which is far too high, which drives chronic inflammation. Their polyphenols are far too low, which means the inflammation rips even further. And that's the reason why we have so much chronic degenerative disease. Not everybody needs this approach. Some people are eating healthy food anyway, a few, and I don't believe in medicating everybody. So I like to work on the basis of testing. Let's take a couple of drops of blood, measure the cell membrane fatty acid ratios. If you have the right ratio, you don't need this. If you have the wrong ratio, then use this omega-3 lipophile polyphenol combination. And what we can guarantee is that because of the enhanced delivery system, we can get you down to below the critical five to one ratio in about three to four months. Um, getting below five is, appears to dramatically improve your health prospects. If you have inflammatory symptoms, they will tend to go away. Uh, I find that when someone has a serious healthcare problem, and I mean really a serious problem, I will then try to bring the ratio lower than that, down to 2.5 to sometimes even 1.5 to one in the most serious of cases. Sometimes you have to get down that low in order to stop the disease from progressing. Um, but it's a safe uh, protocol to follow. And uh, in terms of the therapeutic returns, they are amazing and I don't, I can't talk about that because it's been made illegal for me to do so. But those doctors in the audience, and I'm speaking to doctors, dozens of doctors almost every day now, mm -hmm. are finding out for themselves just how important this is in restoring the health of many of their most critically ill patients. Yeah, okay, and of course we do have a lot of doctors and, and health professionals on, on the call this evening. As I said, we have a, a quite a large mixed audience. Just uh, focusing on the, on the, um, the, the actual um, blood, blood test itself, clearly we have the independent laboratory, which is uh, working on our behalf, processing these, these, these uh, thousands of tests on a monthly basis, uh, tens of thousands now. And we're uh, at a database uh, of just around 500,000 now, which gives us obviously some of the best clinical data uh, looking at fatty acid profiles in, in the world. Um, what is your view on that, Paul, in terms of that, you know, the, the, the proof absolutely defeats doubt. So the test-led pharmaconutrition is clearly, is, is clearly the way forward, yes? I believe it is. What we practice is EBN, or evidence-based nutrition. Uh, the testing for me is crucial. It has to be a third-party independent laboratory. If it wasn't, why would you trust it? We work with VTAS at the University of Oslo, which is, uh, actually works for the WHO. Uh, <laughs> who, whose reputation is actually not so good itself right now, but let's leave that for the moment. But this is a fully independent, fully accredited laboratory, and we wouldn't dream of uh, working with a, a, in any other kind, in any other way. 
Um, our library, I think, is now in excess of 500,000, which makes us the world leaders by a long way in this area. I don't think anybody else has got um, a library that is even 100,000 samples. We have become, we, although we didn't set out to be, but we've become the de facto experts in this rather specialized area of uh, uh, erythrocyte cell membrane lipid profiles. Uh, so when other people, when other researchers in different parts of the world want to get interested in this, and increasingly they are, they come to us, in fact, to, to go through our data. Uh, it's an invaluable information resource. And it's shown us several things. It's shown us that, first of all, using the approach that we do, uh, it's very effective and very consistently brings the six to three ratio down. And we, we start off, in fact, with many people who have already taken fish oil supplements where they don't have a good ratio at all. If you're using pure omega-3s with vitamin E, that doesn't get you to first base. So they come to us with problems very often. They come to us extremely skeptical. We do the test. We find that their ratios are actually not very good at all. We switch them on to our omega-3 lipophile polyphenol combination. And then within 120 days, they're in the right place. And then their symptoms will fade and disappear. Then you actually start to see the therapeutic changes happening. And that's the other thing that our library has shown us. It is that as you bring this ratio down, you consistently see chronic inflammation and its various manifestations becoming less, fading and disappearing. Uh, it, it's been a revelation to, to me and I think to my colleagues. So in terms of the the, 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 if you like the improvement in, in chronic um, underlying disease, uh, we, we're seeing we're seeing that anecdotally. I know we can't talk about it in terms of curatively, but there's so many anecdotal stories. And of course, we have got this this wonderful this wonderful tool, which we can show people that you know they have moved from one place to another, like you say, in a period of four months, and that's why they're starting to feel the benefits of whatever ever particular ailment they may have uh, initially had. I think that it's important to measure whatever it is that you're doing to try to improve your health. And we're developing a test which uh, will show the therapeutic effect of using uh, the prebiotic fibers in Xenobiotic. We already have a, um, a screen which we can adapt, which we have adapted to demonstrate the results of, t of using Viva. Uh, and it, it, we, we have looked at a testing system, which we could use to demonstrate the ability of the skin serum to improve the thickness, elasticity, strength, and hydration of skin. We, we've already done some of that. The question there is, can we take that uh, rather high-tech measuring system and make it into something that can be used at home, which is what I want to do. I'm currently also looking at the uh, idea of developing a self-test, which would measure the therapeutic effect of using Extend, that's really complicated because Extend is like a Swiss army knife and then some because it has so many actors and it's doing so many different things that it's not at all clear what it is we should actually be measuring. We right. have a raft of over a hundred different probes that we could use. And what I'm trying to settle on is a probe or a small set of probes that would be most representative and which we could actually integrate into a self-test format. I want people to be able to test themselves at home, see for themselves what this is doing. Well, because our CEO alluded to the fact that there would be other tests uh, coming uh, in the future. So in, yes. terms of, in terms of looking at that, we're very confident we will have those online at some point soon, yeah? The, the Viva test is, um, it's, it's, a, it's available, it's in prototype form, and it's just a question of printing it out and putting it into the pack. <clears throat> So we're there, we're home and dry with that one. The test for xenobiotic is a little more complex uh, without giving too much away. I can tell you that it is, uh, it's very pragmatic and far more meaningful and far cheaper because it'll be a self-test than any of the stool analysis tests that are currently being offered by various companies, which give you a raft of information which nobody knows how to translate, how to interpret. Oh. This will measure how <coughs> pro or anti-inflammatory your microbiome is. Okay. Well, so that's actually, that's actually meaningful. Now, hugely meaningful. And it's very exciting to think that we started off with one balance test and one test, like you say, by blood spot test, that's now going to lead on to others and, and take us to where we want to be, which is the world's leading uh, 
number one test-led pharmaco nutrition company. Paul, um, just focusing on the science behind the products and just carrying on, uh, I'm aware of our, obviously our time uh, and uh, this evening, um, and I appreciate we started slightly late for, for some of those people on the call. Um, in terms of looking at the health protocol, we have got the, the balance of what you call the orchestra. Can you just, just take us through just the, the use of Extend and the use of Zinzinobiotic in combination with the balance oil? Uh, okay, well, balance oil is really putting out the inflammatory fires in most parts of the body, but it can't reach the large bowel because the omega-3s and the polyphenols are absorbed in the small bowel, so they're, they're not present in the contents of the large bowel. To address the inflammation that is... Uh, really very prevalent now in the colon, and it's due to dysbiosis, we use these time-release blended pre fibers, which are added in a combination, and this was a nightmare to get it right, to get the proportions right, in a way that will start uh, the flip from gram-negative to gram-positive early on in the ascending colon, and maintain that through the transverse descending colon. And so what we're doing is changing the entire microbiome from being predominantly negative to being predominantly gram positive. Now the doctors present and the biologists will know that not all gram negative species are bad for you. Not all gram positive species are good for you. But by putting these probiotic fibers into the gut, we're encouraging the growth of those gram positive bacteria that are able to produce butyrate. You, we refer to these as probiotic species. They produce butyrate and a couple of other things besides. And butyrate is a powerful anti-inflammatory agent and it is also extremely, extremely good at killing cancer cells. So now you have a gut that is producing this compound which is telling the gut, don't be inflamed, do not be cancerous. That's a good idea. If you're eating the modern ultra-processed diet, these fibers have gone because there aren't any prebiotic fibers in Pringles or in Coke. <laughs> now the gram positive species have gone, they're replaced by increasing numbers of gram negative. Now the gram negative species, whatever species they are, have got two things in common. Firstly, they do not produce butyrate. Secondly, they are covered in a substance called lipopolysaccharide. That is the definition of a gram negative bacterium. Lipopolysaccharide is extremely pro-inflammatory. So now you've taken an anti-inflammatory out of the system, you put an extreme pro-inflammatory compound into it, that is why today we see so much IBS and IBD. And in my view, the way to rectify this problem is to go back to where we used to be. Put the prebiotic fibers back in the diet where they always used to be, flip the microbiome over from being predominantly negative to positive, from being pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. When you do that, all kinds of things start going right. Okay. And just back to extend, if you would, again, we're talking about immune system, just the, the, sci the brief science behind that and the use of the beta-glucans. Uh, the beta-glucans, some of my favorite molecules. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're stopping chronic inflammation everywhere in the body, which we can now with balanced oil and uh, xenobiotic, we don't want to leave the person immunocompromised because you need to be able to have a little bit of inflammation when you encounter a pathogen or after you've been physically injured. Some inflammation is necessary to kill off the pathogen and to replace and heal the damaged tissue. So what we do is we put beta-glucans back into the system, again, where they always used to be, and they have the function of priming the cellular components of the innate immune system, macrophages and neutrophils, which then become better able to react quickly to a stimulus to get to that part of the body where they need it and when they get there to be more effective in neutralizing the pathogen. So this is a way of improving resistance to infection and there's a bit of a side effect from that uh, that also does is it reduces your tendency to be allergic. So it's a, a spin-off, it's a, it's a side effect, an entirely positive one. Uh, and uh, but but it's one that's very important, nonetheless, for very many people. Okay, so if we're going to be looking at the use of, like you say, the products in harmony, then the use of the uh, health protocol being extend the balance oil, and obviously the xenobiotic that would give you, in terms of uh, if you like the the, the protocol, the, the best opportunity to improve your your, your immune system. Uh, 
to, to the best advantage. In, in, in short, yes. I mean, what we're doing is we're taking the brakes off. We're neutralizing the, the chronic intoxication, the chronic poisoning that people experience from eating today's diet. We're reestablishing what used to be normal 150 years ago. When you do that, you unlock people's true biological potential. Fantastic. Um, I'm acutely aware that Steve Morley is uh, on, on this call this evening and didn't have the opportunity to join at the beginning. He held the fort whilst we were all trying to get on. Um, I don't know, Steve, uh, if you want to join the call at this point, is he able to uh, to join? Yeah, I'm here, Scott. I'm back. What a great job you're doing. So, you know, I've really learned a lot tonight. I mean, I think the only question I really have for you, Paul, um, and fantastic job. I really appreciate everything you do with us. Uh, but, you know, Zenzino products are really having a huge impact on people's lives. What do you think the future looks like for Zenzino and the impact that our products will have on global health and well-being? The, the Blue Zone data, and in particular the data from the mid-Victorian era, indicate to us that if we can improve the national diet to the point where it's getting closer to the, uh, the Victorian diet, we should be able to reduce the burden of chronic degenerative disease by something close to 90%. So nine out of 10 cases of heart disease, cancer, neurodegeneration will go away. That's what the data tell us. If we can achieve that, we will transform the health of this country. There'll still be a smaller numbers of people who will develop those diseases because they have strong genetic risk factors and those we can't yet help, not with this approach anyway, but we can do an enormous amount to reduce the, the burden of public chronic ill health, which is clearly nothing to do with who we are. It's nothing to do with genetics. It's nothing to do with the fact that we're getting older. It is everything to do with the fact that we're being chronically poisoned by the ultra processed foods that are now have become such a large part of our diet. No, that's, that's fantastic, Paul, and I uh, really appreciate your time tonight and uh, really look forward to working with you in the future. Um, I think we'll end the call on that note and in the back office for the partners, we do have the calendar which highlights all the future meetings we have. Um, but Paul, great job, really appreciate it. Um, you have a blog as well. Can you just finish, you have a blog and people have, a, have view that? Can you give us the address for that? Um, I'll tell you what, I'll just type it in. That's brilliant. This will be really good information for everyone. And obviously you're on the Cinzino.tv as well, which is great. Yes. Um, Scott, well, have, you got, have you got any finish here? Are you finished? You got any no, there was um, obviously a series of questions that has come in from partners and so on and so forth. But I think tonight, just given the fact we've been running uh, behind time, we, we, we'll leave that. I think if we... We do reconvene, we reconvene another call and uh, hope we can do that with you in the future, very near future, Paul, then we can uh, maybe explore some of those questions in a little bit more detail on behalf of the, uh, the, the partners that have asked the questions. Um, no, I think, I think really, uh, I think of the summary uh, that, that you just made about the statement of the future of both was in Zeno and the use of our products within um, the, uh, the, the, the sort of greater popul population going forward is going to do nothing but obviously improve underlying health. And uh, as we all know, that can only be, be a good thing. Have you got any comments you'd like to make, Paul, in terms of your own closing comments? Uh, well, if people would like to step across to, to the blog, which is drpaulclayton.eu, they'll see... Uh, Okay, it's a kind of, it's, it's my soapbox. I don't, I don't really actually think anybody reads it. I don't think anybody ever goes there because it's not really designed for public consumption. It's just where I ride my hobby horse and I, I talk and write about the things that I find interesting, research topics, you know, jumping from one area to another. The last uh, four or five posts have been about COVID-19 because I've been asked to talk about that by various people. And so you'll find one or two things there that uh, you might find surprising. Um, I think that we are not exactly being told the truth about it. We're not being given the information that we could use to um, improve our overall levels of risk. Uh, and so I, I think that uh, people would like to go there and have a, a look at the, the last couple of posts. They'll find some interesting um, 
this is bits of information that they can use to materially help themselves. Thank you, Paul. I think um, from my point of view, it's been an absolute pleasure to host you this evening. I'm sure Steve, Steve completely agrees with that. And I'm sorry about the technical difficulties to everybody that we had earlier on. And uh, it's just a, it's almost an embarrassment of riches to have over 300 people wanting to be on the call. And uh, that's the numbers we made tonight, Paul, 300 people listening to our dialogue. So like I say, it's been my privilege to, to, to talk to you. Did and, you actually um, manage to get let 300 people into the room? I thought we were, we, 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 had a, uh, we, we did. We, we had Mr. Mr. Dave Ives, and I think Mr. Steve Morley between them managed to get uh, a, an improvement on the Zoom. And uh, yeah, we were able to move it from 100 to, to 300 people. So success okay. all around. <laughs> so <laughs> that's great. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Paul. It's been, like I say, my absolute pleasure to conduct this, uh, this meeting with you tonight. And Steve, I'll hand it over to you in terms of closing comments. Thank you again, Paul. Yeah, great job, Scott. Great job, Paul. Um, really appreciate your time and energy and everything you do for Zenzino. To everyone out there, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, look forward to speaking to you very soon. Uh, the recording of tonight's uh, Zoom call will be um, posted on Team Zenzino UK, uh, Team Zeno UK. So you can uh, go there. Also, um, email it to some of your leaders. Um, so yeah, very exciting. Thank you all and look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.